So welcome everyone to another one of our Zoom presentations. It's not quite as good as live, but uh, they will have to do for now. In any case, the Victorian era, uh, I've always been infatuated with it for several reasons. One, so many great discoveries made during that, that era and uh, it accomplished basically, uh, you know, it's uh, close to 100 years. It's the 1800s, basically, is what we refer to as the Victorian era. And a lot happened then. But for me, it's especially interesting and important because I associated with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Holmes is my favorite uh, literary character. And um, of course, it's because he's got this great talent for making observations and coming to conclusions. That's why I like him so much. And especially his motto, that is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data because one insensibly begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And obviously, uh, I believe in facts uh, should be germinating the, the theories. So this is really why I've uh, liked Holmes uh, uh, so much. Uh, he's of course very scientifically minded. In the adventure of the devil's foot, for example, there's a murder that is carried out uh, by vaporizing the uh, chemicals that are found in a root called uh, the devil's foot or a plant called the devil's foot. It doesn't exist in reality. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, vehicle to talk about poisonings in, in, in the book. And Jeremy Brett, who is, I think to me, the best actor who's ever portrayed Sherlock Holmes, figures it all out. Now, although this is fictional, the fact is that in the 1800s, there were substances that were vaporized into the air, not to kill people, but for therapeutic possibilities. For example, this device here, the vapocresoline, was very popular. And you had this uh, liquid, this brown liquid that you would put into the cup on the top, light the flame underneath it, and uh, this would uh, dispense into the air. And it was claimed to cure basically every disease that you have uh, ever heard of. And of course, when you see something like that, you can rest assured that it doesn't cure any of these. It was widely advertised, and um, the active ingredient here was a substance called creosote. And you're probably familiar with creosote. Creosote is this crud that stays behind um, in a fireplace. It builds up in chimneys, and you have to have your chimneys cleaned because it could catch uh, fire. Anyway, it contains dozens and dozens of different compounds some of which, like the cresols, might have some antimicrobial activity, but not, not in the form that this uh, vapocrystalline lamp was supposed to uh, have, have an effect. <laughs> but I tell you someone who would have had in the 1800s uh, an interesting relationship with fire uh, was uh, uh, Charles Dickens. Now you may think, you know, what on earth is going on here? How would he have a relationship with, uh, with fire? Uh, Dickens, a uh, great author. Uh, I loved his books. Uh, Tale of Su Two Cities is a classic. I, I really like the way that it, uh, it begins. It is the best of times. It's the worst of times because that also applies to er our era uh, now. But the reason that fire comes into this is because in one of his classics, Bleak House, a man, Mr. Crook, basically ignites and undergoes spontaneous combustion. And he disappears except for some remnants of his, his body. <clears throat> In those days, spontaneous combustion was believed to be a real possibility. People thought that especially if you were drunk, your tissues inside would be saturated with alcohol and that is what could uh, ignite. George Henry Lewis was a, a philosopher, an amateur physiologist and a literary critic in those days. And he really took issue with Dickens's portrayal of the spontaneous combustion, because he said that although this was a work of fiction, uh, it, it was being presented as if it were a real possibility. 
and they they argued about this back and forth uh, for years, uh, with Dickens maintaining that in fact it was possible that people could uh, ignite and spontaneously combust from the from the inside, and uh, this of course did not sit well with Lewis, uh, because he was uh, very adamant about having to rely on facts and having proof. Whereas Dickens just referred to anecdotes, such as the one about Cornelia Zangari Bandi, who is a, a, a countess in Italy, uh, as you can see in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s, who according to stories uh, uh, ignited and she had just gone to bed. And when they came to see her in the morning, most of her body was gone. The only thing that was left was an oily residue and her legs, which had been detached from the body. <clears throat> well, Dickens quoted this as, as proof of spontaneous combustion. Of course, it is not proof. This is nothing more than uh, a story that is, is being told. And uh, we have no evidence and certainly no scientific plausibility for anyone igniting in this fashion the way that Dickens described it in uh, Bleak House. But that doesn't mean that fire, of course, doesn't have a real role to, to play in history and, and, and in science. Of course it does. And this gentleman knew all about that. We're looking here at Charles Goodyear playing around on his stove. And uh, that turned out to be extremely important. Charles Goodyear uh, basically is associated with rubber. And he really was the one who made rubber into a usable commodity. Rubber comes from a tree. The tree grows in, in South America. You make an incision in the tree and the sap uh, flows out. And that is natural rubber. When the water from it evaporates, you get the rubbery substance and natives knew how to use this. So Joseph Priestley, brilliant scientist in England, uh, knew about rubber. It had been imported into Europe and he had carried out some experience with it. And, he found that there was really only one use for the substance. What was that? In those days, of course, they wrote with pencils. And if you made a mistake, you could take this material and rub out the mistake that you had made, make the correction. And he came up with the name rubber because it was used to rub out the marks of a, of a pencil. Well, the natives had found a, various uses for rubber. Uh, for example, they were able to make galoshes. They would heat up the rubber, put their feet into it. It would then mold around the foot. And when it cooled down, they would have these primitive galoshes. And then in uh, England, Charles Mackintosh found that you could dissolve rubber in carbon disulfide and then use the solution to paint it on fabric. And when the solvent evaporated, the fabric had become rubberized and you had a Macintosh. And this became very, very popular in the UK, of course, because they have a lot of rainy weather there. It was not very adaptable in the US because there you have a lot of hot weather. And what happened was that the rubber melted in the hot weather. So it was not a great commercial success on this side of the, of the pond. Now back to our Goodyear story and why fire played such an important role. Uh, Goodyear was adamant that he would find a way to take the naturally occurring rubber uh, and improve it. He wanted to make it more stretchy uh, and uh, he worked on this. He mixed the natural rubber with all kinds of things, even tried mixing it with cream cheese and with soup and uh, none of that worked. But finally one day when he was brewing up his rubber on his hot stove, some of it spilled and he had been carrying out some experiment with sulfur. And when the sulfur and the rubber combined on the hot stove, the material changed its properties. It became vulcanized. Now that name came from the ancient Roman god Vulcan, the god of fire, because this transformation had been carried out by fire. Now, what exactly happened here, we now know, he of course did not realize it at that time, is that the long molecules of naturally occurring rubber, so-called polyisoprene, were linked together with the sulfur atoms. And this strengthened it and made it more resilient. <clears throat> he uh, got together with Nathaniel Hayward, an entrepreneur. They started up a company, vulcanizing rubber. 
and the product became very popular. In fact, so popular that they were invited to exhibit their wares at the 1851 Crystal Palace um, exhibition in London. This was a very, very big deal. It was the largest World's Fair uh, to have been organized up to that time. And uh, Goodyear had a whole display there, Goodyear's Vulcanite Court, it was called, where he showed furniture and desks and even a Bible to be made out of uh, rubber. Uh, pontoon boats were featured. Remember, this was in the middle 1800s, and those were made of, uh, of rubber. Now, there's some contention about who actually found the way to combine sulfur with natural rubber, because in England, uh, Thomas Hancock had also carried out very similar experiments. However, uh, although he patented his work before Goodyear did, Goodyear carried out his work years before, and uh, Hancock had some samples of Goodyear's rubber. Now it's questionable whether or not he had been able to analyze it to know that it had been combined with sulfur, but that's a possibility. In any case, Thomas Hancock in England is, is uh, said to be the father of the rubber industry. And the rubber industry was big uh, because now you could uh, you know, rubberize canvas and uh, carriages could be uh, you know, uh, made essentially impermeable to the rain, which was uh, a big plus, of course, in, in the UK. Tires uh, at first were just wood, and then they were coated with rubber. The rubber was just stretched over them, but it was not inflated. The inflatable rubber tire uh, was the brainchild of uh, John Boyd Dunlop. And uh, actually it was his uh, grandchild who had a, a small bicycle that had been given to her. And she complained that her bum hurt because of course the, there was no really shock absorption there at all. And that's when Dunlop came up with the first pneumatic tire, the inflatable uh, tire. But it was the Michelin brothers uh, in the late 1890s. Uh, who replaced uh, just the wooden tire with uh, rubber tires on the first uh, automobiles. So a lot was happening in, in, in the uh, 1800s. But let's get back to uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Uh, they had a large number of children, but the one that I want to uh, emphasize here is uh, Prince Leopold. And the reason that this is so interesting is because Prince Leopold was the first royal baby ever to be born under the influence of an anesthetic. Uh, Queen Victoria was anesthetized with chloroform by her private physician, and that was Dr. John Snow. And uh, Snow knew all about uh, chloroform. He had heard about this from James Simpson, a Scottish doctor, who had uh, been experimenting with all kinds of vapors to see whether or not he could develop an anesthetic because he had heard about ether having been introduced in the 1850s in the United States as, a, as an anesthetic and he was searching for others. And in those days, uh, they tested things out on themselves as incredible as that now seems. And one day he and his friends just inhaled some chloroform and realized that it had a very strong uh, uh, anesthetizing effect. And uh, he suggested this to Jon Snow and uh, Snow used chloroform on Queen Victoria when she gave birth to Prince uh, Leopold. Well, John Snow made another very, very important contribution. And uh, this was his uh, basically identifying cholera as a waterborne disease. There was an epidemic of cholera in London at the time, especially in a region uh, of, of London where uh, houses were centered around one single street, Broad Street. And the closer they were to that street, the more likely it was that they ha would have someone in the house who suffered from cholera. And uh, Snow looked into this. He wanted to know how this could be happening. 
And eventually he was able to determine that what these homes where cholera struck had in common was that they were all getting their water from a pump that was in Broad Street. And he asked the mayor of London to remove the handle of that pump to solve the cholera epidemic. The mayor, of course, thought he was crazy. What could the water have anything to do with this disease? But nevertheless, they did remove the pump and the cholera epidemic uh, faded. It had already begun to fade somewhat when they removed the handle of the pump, but that basically ended the uh, epidemic. And this is one of the great moments in the history of epidemiology. And it is commemorated in, in London because right where that original pump stood in Broad Street, there now is a metal statue of that, uh, of that pump. And as you can see, the pump does not have a handle. And uh, obviously the reason it does not have a handle is to commemorate the pump that did not have a handle. And just behind this, uh, this pump is the John Snow pub, where I suspect not much water of any kind is, uh, is consumed. And indeed, even back in John Snow's days, those people who drank mostly beer were not likely to suffer from cholera because the brewing of alcoholic beverages, of course, is not conducive to the uh, cholera bacteria in, 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 the, in the brew. So John Snow is widely regarded uh, as the, the father of epidemiology. Now, he did not know about microbes, even though, of course, he was a contemporary of Louis Pasteur. But in those days, information did not get spread around very, very um, easily. Uh, Louis Pasteur, of course, was a chemist by training, uh, not a doctor or a biologist, as, as many people believe. And uh, he really was the, the uh, first one to talk about germs, microbes, as being uh, causative factors in disease. And he really can be regarded as the, the uh, uh, father of uh, microbiology and uh, the father of the germ theory of, of disease. So uh, in, in the middle 1800s, when he was carrying out his experiments, uh, word started to go around that disease could be caused by these microbes that you could only see through the, the microscope. And uh, that, uh, of course, uh, intrigued doctors because they uh, had to deal with infections all the time. But of course, they didn't know what was causing those infections until Pasteur came along and suggested that microbes could be an issue. And um, Joseph Lister in England uh, heard about, about this and he came up with a way to control microbes in, uh, in the operating room. He invented this device, which was a phenol dispenser. A phenol is a chemical that can be isolated from petroleum and he thought that it might have disinfectant properties that could take care of Pasteur's microbes because he knew that it was being used to treat the smell of sewage. And operating rooms in those days very often smelled very bad because of infections. And he wondered if the same stuff might not be effective against microbes. So in, he invented this uh, sprayer which would be sprayed in the operating room when they were carrying out operations. And note that in those days, they didn't have antiseptic techniques. In fact, the doctors would get dressed up in their finest clothes to carry out uh, uh, operations. But this was a big breakthrough, uh, the spraying of phenol into the air to cut down on, on microbes. And uh, even though, of course, you could not see those things, the evidence was there that when they sprayed phenol, uh, the patients were much less likely to develop uh, infections. The 1800s also was the beginning of the age of electricity. Uh, Luigi Galvani around 1800 had discovered that uh, uh, severed frog legs would move when they were uh, connected with two dissimilar metals. He didn't really done, didn't understand what was going on there. He didn't understand that he had inadvertently created a, a battery uh, from the two dissimilar metals and the frog leg acting as an uh, electrolyte and the frog leg began to quiver when he attached the two electrodes. But Alessandro Volta in Italy correctly interpreted uh, the uh, 
uh, Galvani experiment, and he built the first battery that you see in front of him here. It was uh, layers of, uh, of uh, dissimilar metals, uh, mostly uh, silver uh, or uh, copper and zinc, uh, which were separated by uh, paper impregnated with salt. That was the electrolyte. And this produced a current. Uh, of course, this was really the beginning of age of electricity, the first time that ele electricity could be generated at will. And this really intrigued Michael Faraday who I think can be considered uh, not only to be the greatest scientist of the 1800s of Victorian era, but uh, uh, perhaps the greatest scientist who ever lived. Uh, when you consider everything that he, he did, uh, he discovered a number of elements, and, uh, but his major uh, uh, fame comes from his work with electricity. Michael Faraday was the first to introduce the idea of electrolysis. Electrolysis is the uh, notion that you can put uh, two electrodes into a solution, pass an electric current through that solution, and uh, positive ions will move to the negative electrode and negative ions will move to the positive electrode. And as you can see in this simple experiment here where you have a sodium chloride, a salt solution, uh, the electrolysis experiment uh, produces hydrogen and chlorine. Anyway, uh, Faraday carried out a large number of experiments where he would take different kinds of solutions, pass electric current through them to see what would happen. That's how he discovered a number of, um, uh, of elements. However, uh, I think uh, what really deserves a, a great deal of, of acclaim for Michael Faraday was his work with electricity and uh, the idea of the electric motor. Now, Hans Christian Orsted in, in, in Europe had made a very interesting discovery. Uh, if he took a compass, as you can see here, and uh, put a wire on top of it and passed an electric current through the wire, and the electric current would be generated by Volta's battery, a version of which you see at the top here, uh, the needle would move. Now today, I guess we're not so surprised by that, but in those days, I mean, to pass an electric current through a wire and watch the needle and the compass move where there was no connection between the wire and the compass, that was pretty interesting. So if uh, passing a, a, a current through the wire could make a, a compass move, then uh, Faraday wondered, what about the other way around? Could a magnet, because the needle of a compass, of course, is a magnet, could a magnet move an electric current? So that's the question that he, he asked. And he designed an experiment where he had a magnet, as you can see, with a north and south pole. And then he hung beside the magnet a copper wire, which of course is a good conductor of electricity. It was dipping into a pool of mercury, which is also a very good uh, carrier of electricity. And one end of the battery was attached to the mercury. The other end was attached to the uh, copper wire. And when the wire came close to the magnet, indeed, it started to revolve around the magnet. Why? Because uh, a wire that carries a current carries a magnetic field. And when the magnetic field interacts with another magnetic field, you can get motion. I mean, we all know that if you have two magnets and you try to squeeze the like poles together, they try to push apart. That's exactly what was happening here. That copper wire moved, and this really was the beginning of the idea of the electric motor. Uh, so Faraday, uh, really uh, can be credited with developing the electric uh, motor just by noticing how this wire moved when a current passed through it and it was placed near, near uh, a magnet. But to me, uh, one of the most important contributions that Michael Faraday made was to public education. He was the first one to really hold popular public lectures on science. And these were extremely popular. They were held every Friday night at the Royal Institution on Albemarle Street in, in, uh, in London. And it was so popular 
Remember that this was before TV, before radio. So live entertainment was the only way. These Friday night lectures became so popular that Albemarle Street was the first street in the British Empire to be made one way in order to ease the uh, traffic from the carriages. And the Faraday lectures are carried on to this very day. The most famous one is the Christmas lecture, which is always presented by some very noted scientist. And today it is televised around the world. But Faraday was a marvelous lecture, lecturer and um, he poked the interest of many, many people. And certainly uh, I think put a lot of uh, students on a scientific uh, track. Well, once electricity became known, of course, it was applied in all kinds of ways. Sir William Crookes, uh, a physicist, found a way to take an evacuated tube, a vacuum tube, and pass an electric current through it. And he didn't know exactly what was happening here, but he saw that when he put a cross, as you can see uh, inside of the tube, and he put a phosphorescent screen behind that cross, the cross would block whatever kind of rays were coming out of the cathode of the negative uh, electrode. He really didn't know what to make of this, uh, but it turned out to have an interesting uh, uh, spin-off uh, because J.J. Thompson, uh, an experimentalist, uh, worked with the so-called uh, cathode ray tube or the Crookes tube and discovered that these invisible rays that were going from the cathode to the anode were little pockets of energy that he began to call electrons. And now we know electrons are fundamental particles in, in all matter. Uh, it was interesting how the charlatans jumped on this because anytime that you have sort of a new development, uh, they try to take advantage of that. So these um, uh, Crookes tubes or discharge tubes as they were called, were sold as a sort of wondrous treatments for all kinds of disease. Obviously they didn't really do anything, but they sure look good. So here's a whole kit, uh, as you can see, with various kinds of tubes that would uh, glow when electric current was passed, uh, passed through them. And it was while experimenting with one of these tubes that Wilhelm Röntgen made a very interesting discovery. Uh, he had some photographic paper in a drawer and he was playing around with this cathode tube. And when he looked inside the drawer, he saw that the film had been exposed <coughs> because these invisible rays that were coming out of this tube, X-rays as he called them, X because he didn't really know what they were and X is the mathematical symbol for an unknown. But these x-rays, uh, of course, turned out to have a very, very important function. And here is the first x-ray that Röntgen ever made, which was of his wife's hand. And as you can see, she was wearing a ring. So the x-rays uh, exposed the photographic paper, except, of course, where an object was put on top of the paper because the bones blocked the x-rays. So this is what gave the uh, amazing uh, uh, image and uh, Röntgen eventually received the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Prince Albert, uh, who was Queen Victoria's husband, was uh, a huge promoter of science. And uh, he was uh, despairing because he didn't think that English science was quite at the place where it should be. And that's because he had heard Justus von Liebig who was a very, very well-known professor of chemistry in Germany. And he had heard him when he was on a lecture tour in England where Liebig uh, with his German superiority said that England is not the land of science. There's only widespread dilettantism. Their chemists are ashamed to be known by that name because it has been assumed by the apothecaries who are despised. And indeed today in England, the whom we would call pharmacists are called chemists and a pharmacy is called a chemist's shop. And in those days, chemists were indeed despised because there were not many good things to be had in these apothecaries. There were a lot of poisons there that, that uh, you know, if you took them uh, in the wrong dose could have catastrophic uh, consequences. Anyway, Prince Albert 
did not like the idea that uh, uh, Britain was being outraced in science by the Germans, which is interesting because Prince Albert himself was of German uh, origin. Anyway, he decided to do something about this. <clears throat> so he invited Professor August Wilhelm Hoffmann, who at that time already was a very well-known uh, professor in Germany, to come to England and uh, to found the so-called Royal College of Chemistry, where top-notch students would be invited uh, to be educated specifically in chemistry. And this was not done before at that time in England. Uh, education was very sporadic when it came to science. But uh, this establishment was to concentrate on, on, on chemistry. One day, there was a knock on the door from a 16-year-old boy, William Henry Perkin, who was too young to be admitted as a student to this prestigious uh, royal uh, college. But he had become enamored of chemistry as a boy. Uh, he had read about chemical experiments, he had carried out some at home, and he decided that this really was for him. So when he heard about this uh, uh, royal college being established, he wanted in. But he was too young to be a student. But he begged and he begged. And I guess he must have been very persuasive because uh, Hoffman said, all right, <clears throat> well, you can't come in as a, as a student until you uh, turn 18, but uh, you can come and help some of the other students. So he came in sort of as an assistant and he turned out to be very good. He, he was able to do much more than just wash glassware. Uh, he started to to help with chemical reactions. And he, he had very good hands. He had uh, good intuition. And um, uh, he did far, far better than anyone could have uh, imagined. But he was also uh, very inquisitive and uh, constantly was asking Hoffman to give him something more challenging uh, to do. Now, at that time, there was a great need for quinine. Quinine was uh, the only drug that was effective in the treatment of malaria. Malaria is a terrible disease that is carried uh, by a mosquito. It's actually a parasite that uh, it, the mosquito carries in its blood. And when the female mosquito bites someone, it can transmit this, uh, this parasite and that causes malaria. Terrible disease, it comes with high fever and uh, very high death rate. Quinine was able to curb this disease. The trouble is that quinine was very hard to get. Quinine comes from the bark of the cinchona tree that grows in South America. And it was introduced into Europe by the Jesuits who had heard about it or had learned about it from the uh, Peruvian natives when they were trying to convert them to Christianity. <clears throat> and they introduced it back to Europe where it was called either Pope's powder or Jesuit powder because it was introduced by the, uh, by the Jesuits. But the problem was that there wasn't enough of this uh, because it was hard to, to get enough of the uh, centaur bark back to, to Europe. So August Hoffman wondered whether or not it might be possible to reproduce this natural product in the laboratory. <clears throat> Now that was pretty ingenious in those days because they didn't know very much about chemical synthesis. Uh, they were able to determine the chemical composition of matter. So Hoffman had been able to determine uh, the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen ratios in quinine. But of course they didn't know anything about how these uh, atoms were joined together. They didn't know anything about molecular structure. But Hoffman knew that when you took coal tar, the tar that was left behind when coal burns, you could extract from that a chemical called aniline, which to him had a chemical composition that was very similar to quinine. However, it didn't have any oxygen. So his idea was that if you could take aniline and react it with an oxidizing agent, something that would add oxygen, then you could make quinine. Now today, uh, we know that this was uh, an absolute uh, impossibility. 
aniline and quinine are very, very different in terms of their molecular structure, but they knew nothing about molecular structure in those days. So hindsight, of course, is always 2020. So Hoffman had the idea of using an oxidizing agent reacted with aniline, hoping to get quinine. In 1856, when the Christmas holidays rolled around, uh, the school was going to be shut down. And young Perkin asked Hoffman to give him something that he could do at home. He didn't want to be without chemistry for two weeks. So Hoffman said, sort of, you know, just off the top of his head, why don't you go and try to oxidize some aniline, see if you can make quinine. So uh, young Perkin took him at his word. He went home, he took his chemicals, he took some aniline, he tried various kinds of oxidizing agents, but all he got was different oils and cruds. The biggest problem was always how to clean his glassware. But one day he carried out a reaction and he couldn't clean his glassware with water, so he tried to clean it out with alcohol. And when he added the alcohol, all of a sudden, the solution turned into a beautiful new color that he had never seen before. In fact, nobody had ever seen before. This was the color that was destined to be called mauve. It was a kind of purple. Now, before this time, of course, colors were known. I mean, obviously, if you go back to the Bible, Joseph and his coat of many colors. You ever wondered about that? How were they able to, you know, biblical days do this? Well, of course, they did it with natural dyes. Uh, the matter plant has a root, and the root produces a red dye that can be used to color fabric. It used, for example, to color the red coats of the British Army. But in the biblical days, they could have used it to make fabrics red. If you wanted blue, well, then you had better know where to find the indigo plant. And the indigo plant produces uh, a substance that can be converted into blue. It isn't blue to start with, uh, but when it is uh, reacted with some other materials, urine being an example, it does turn blue. So of course, natural dyes were known. But now Perkin, had made the first ever synthetic dye, and he called it mauvine. It was a, a color that hadn't been seen before. Purple had always been a highly prized color. Uh, Tyrian purple, for example, uh, came from mollusks that were found uh, on, in the ocean and on the beaches of Tyre, which was a town in Lebanon, in ancient uh, Lebanon. And these snails, produced a natural uh, purple color. It was very expensive because it was very hard to, to extract. So now when Perkin all of a sudden was able to produce this color in the laboratory, that had great commercial appeal. He borrowed some money from his father and he built a factory at Greenford Green in London where he began to mass produce this, this color. And Queen Victoria loved it. And of course, if the queen loved it, uh, everyone wanted this dye. So Mauvin became extremely popular. Perkin uh, went on to uh, show how it could even be used to color stamps. And the so-called penny royals uh, in the 1860s, uh, for any of you stamp collectors, are colored with Perkin's original mauve. He went on to show that you could take coal tar extracts and make a whole range of colors out of it. And this gave birth to the whole dye industry. And today, of course, numerous synthetic dyes can be made, uh, but the technology really goes back to Perkins' accidental uh, discovery. And uh, uh, the brilliant colors that you see today are all synthetic, uh, they are, sourced essentially from raw materials that come from petroleum and with a sequence of chemical reactions can be converted into a whole range of, of colors. Anyway, William Henry Perkin became the elder statesman of chemistry. Uh, he uh, developed a reaction still known today as the Perkin reaction. Uh, he became immensely wealthy uh, because of his discovery of, of, of mauve. And in 1906, he was invited to the United States to be the recipient of the first ever Perkin Research uh, Medal. 
And uh, this is a, a medal that is still uh, being given uh, every year to a top uh, industrial uh, chemist that is very much sought after. It's a huge honor to win the, the Perkin Medal. And what is interesting about it is that the award ceremony uh, now uh, goes around the country, but originally it was always in New York and at a restaurant called Del Delmonico's. And uh, it's a, a beautiful restaurant. It's one of the top restaurants in the city and it was back in 1906 as well. And this was the first ever Perkin Award dinner. And the first awardee was Perkin himself. And there he is uh, together with all the, uh, the gentlemen. And you will notice that they are all wearing bow ties. And the bow ties were colored with Perkin's original uh, mauve. And to this day, if a gentleman is invited to the Perkin dinner, they get a bow tie that is colored with Perkin's original mauve because in 1906, he brought a sample with him that he left at Columbia University. And every year, a little bit of that is taken out to, buy, to dye some silk. And today, ladies are invited too. They get a silk scarf that is also colored with, uh, with mauve. And it commemorates this very important discovery. Uh, pretty soon, there were all kinds of companies, of course, that were selling uh, aniline dyes, as they were called because the original discovery had been made from, uh, from aniline. And there were all kinds of uses found for these dyes. In Germany, Paul Ehrlich, uh, a physician and a researcher, uh, discovered that the dye was able to visualize microbes. So that if you put a sample on a, on a glass plate, when you were looking uh, through a microscope, you could use some of these dyes to make the microbes, the bacteria, uh, visible because they would absorb the dye so you could see them in, in the microscope. And then Ehrlich had an idea. He thought, if these bacteria can absorb the dye, then what about making that dye poisonous so that uh, it will kill any bacteria that absorbs it? And this gave birth to the first ever antibiotic. And this was a substance called salversan. And if you look at the molecular structure here, you see that it has arsenic incorporated into it because the basic structure here was that of a dye. But what Ehrlich did was he incorporated arsenic into the dye because he knew the dye would be absorbed by bacteria. And indeed the idea worked. So the arsenic was lethal to the bacteria. And arsenic, as we know, of course, can be a very, very poisonous uh, substance. And uh, it uh, was used in, in those days, not only to visualize uh, or, or to kill bacteria by means of salversan, it was also incorporated into dyes because you can make various kinds of dyes with arsenic compounds. And uh, you could make beautiful, uh, beautiful colors, especially one called Paris green. Uh, which was made with arsenic. And in the Victorian era, this became very, very popular, even though it was very difficult substance to work with. But I mean, that was the, a problem for people in the industry who worked with it because you would get all kinds of lesions uh, playing around with, with arsenic. However, the green color that was produced was very, very impressive. And uh, the uh, Victorian era, is also often called the green era. Now, not green in the sense that we talk about today. Today, when we use the term green, uh, we imply that it is something that is non-toxic or biodegradable. In those days, they talked about a green era because of the widespread use of the green color. Uh, it was used to color furniture fabric. It was used to color carpets. It was used to color uh, wallpaper. And uh, this was the most popular color that was used indoors in the uh, Victorian uh, era. The trouble here was that these colors were made with arsenic. And it pretty soon became apparent that some of this arsenic would go out into the air from the paint and from the wallpaper. And obviously that 
was recognized as being toxic. So you can see there were some wallpapers that were advertised as being free from arsenic. And this was one of the first free from advertisements. Today, of course, we have free from asbestos, free from parabens, free from chemicals. But this was one of the first free from uh, advertisements. Uh, uh, but the public wasn't free from arsenic because the green color indeed was so beautiful that it was much sought after. And green fabrics were very popular. And sometimes people would get skin reactions because some of the arsenic would leach out. Napoleon supposedly, uh, according to some people, was poisoned with arsenic. When he was imprisoned by the British, the room in which he was uh, held had green wallpaper. And some of the symptoms of uh, uh, Napoleon when he was dying could be interpreted as symptoms of arsenic poisoning, although they are much more uh, conducive to stomach cancer, which is most likely what Napoleon died of. But it makes for a very uh, interesting uh, story. And uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, he did have some arsenic in his hair, which, which he did, uh, does not prove that he died of arsenic poisoning. I mean, it certainly, uh, may relate to the fact that he lived in an environment where there were some arsenic compounds in the air, but that is not proof that he was, uh, that his death was caused uh, by that. Uh, interestingly enough, in those days, in the Victorian era, uh, arsenic lotions were used by ladies in small doses, of course, because it makes for a very white complexion. And that was prized in those days because it was the peasants who worked out in the sun who had a dark conception, uh, complexion. So if you wanted to show that you were of the noble class, you wanted to be white. And amazingly, arsenic was also available as a medication, as you can see it here together with strychnine. And uh, it was said to cure virtually any disease. Of course, it didn't cure anything at all. Although today there are some arsenic compounds, amazingly, that are used in the treatment of some uh, leukemias. One person who is known to have taken arsenic on a pretty regular basis was Charles Darwin. Darwin was plagued by all kinds of health problems uh, throughout his life. And uh, when uh, some researchers look at the symptoms of which he complained, uh, they say that those could be the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. And uh, yes, he did take small doses of, of arsenic because he suffered from all kinds of stomach uh, problems and he thought that that would, uh, would help. Of course, uh, this will never be confirmed, but it is a possibility. Darwin obviously also was uh, in the Victorian era and his book, The Origin of the Species is one of the most famous books uh, ever written because it really is the beginning of uh, evolution uh, theory. There were numerous inventions uh, that were made in the uh, Victorian era. Thomas Edison, uh, of course, is very often credited with inventing the light bulb, which is wrong. He did not invent the light bulb. Uh, the light bulb was actually invented 50 years earlier in England by Joseph Swan. But what Edison did do uh, was to uh, make a, a workable electric bulb, one that could be commercially uh, produced. And uh, he did this with, with uh, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, engineer, uh, uh, he was really an engineer at heart, not a scientist. And uh, he even said on repeat occasions that if I can't make money with it, I don't want to make it. So it's not that he had a real scientific mind. He just wanted to make things work. And he usually did it by brute force. So with the light bulb, he just tried hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of filaments until he found one that, that really worked. And uh, so he really did not invent the light bulb. The only thing that uh, uh, Edison really invented, he had many, many patents, but most of those were just things that he adapted or brought to, to uh, made an improved version, whatever. But uh, the um, uh, cylindrical recorders, uh, the phonograph, this really was his invention. 
And uh, this was, uh, of course, very clever and was really the first time that anyone was able to reproduce sound. And uh, the amazing footnote here is that uh, Edison was very hard of hearing. He was practically deaf. And nevertheless, he was able to come up with this uh, uh, phonograph. And uh, of course, uh, today, uh, these are collector's items, but a, a lot of them were, were produced. These cylinders had music that played for about two minutes. And uh, I mean, today, of course, <laughs> it sounds uh, very, very uh, you know, scratchy. And, uh, but in those days, this, this was essentially a miracle to hear music coming out of a of, of a box. Also uh, in the Victorian era, uh, Guglielmo Marconi laid the foundations to uh, radio and uh, for the first time sound could be transmitted over long distances. So look what the Victorian era gave us. It gave us electricity, it gave us radio, it gave us light bulbs, uh, it gave us the dyes and the drugs from which those dyes came. Uh, it gave us uh, synthetic rubbers, uh, vulcanized rubber. Uh, so numerous discoveries. And of course, uh, there could be many, many more that uh, could be mentioned. You know, the steam engine was uh, obviously a great discovery. But let me get back to Charles Dickens, just to finish off uh, here. And his connection to something that you probably have not connected him with, and this is magic. Now in those days, in the uh, 1800s, live performances, of course, were very popular because this was really the only way that, that uh, you could have entertainment. Remember again, this was uh, before television, before uh, movies. And magic shows uh, captivated audiences across Europe. There were some very, very famous uh, magicians. Robert Houdin is probably the most famous one. He was a Frenchman. Uh, he, of course, is the one whose name Eric Weiss eventually stole, added an eye to it, and became Houdini. Anyway, a traveling magician came to England uh, from Vienna, an Austrian by the name of Ludwig Dubler. And uh, young Charles Dickens went to that performance. And he really loved it. He was bitten by the magic bug. And he decided that he wanted to experience this. So after that, he had a discussion with Dubler and he purchased some of his magic equipment. And this, talk about collector's items. This is some of the magic equipment that uh, Dickens purchased at that time from, from Dubler. And he described it uh, in a letter to Professor Fenton, Felton was a friend. Forster and I have purchased the entire stock and trade of a conjurer. The practice and display whereof is entrusted to me and to my dear eyes. If you could see me conjuring the company's watches into tea caddies and causing piece of money to fly and burning pocket handkerchiefs without hurting them, and practicing in my own room without anybody to admire, you would never forget it as long as you live. Throughout his whole writing career, Dickens performed as a magician. And here is one of his uh, play cards. Uh, he had quite elaborate shows. He became very, very good at, at uh, magic. And uh, he was happiest when he was able to perform and entertain his audiences. There are books that have been written about uh, Dickens and his magic and about the tricks that he, he performed. And uh, uh, it's very interesting to look into this because this is not a side of Dickens that most people would be uh, familiar with. And you can learn about all the, the effects that he, he uh, carried out. And one of his favorites was the burning book or the burning handkerchief, which uh, once the flames had been extinguished was none the worse for wear. And uh, this, this is uh, an effect that I've performed on many, many an occasion, usually do it with money, uh, burning money. And uh, it's actually very simple to do. All you need is a mixture of water and alcohol. 
and you dip the whatever you're going to burn, whether it's a book or, or currency, you dip it into the water alcohol solution and then you can set fire to it. The alcohol will burn. Alcohol is volatile, it will evaporate and it will catch fire, but the water will keep the rest of it uh, cool. And you can time it such that um, uh, if you put just the right amount of alcohol and water and set fire to it and the alcohol burns off, it will also take some of the water with it. The water will evaporate that is heated up by the burning alcohol. And if you time it just right, you are left with uh, the money or whatever else you were uh, you had set fire to uh, dry and uh, none the worse for, for wear. And of course, if someone is not aware of the secret of how this is done, it looks to be absolutely uh, magical. So Dickens was magical, not only in his writings, but also in his magic performance. So uh, I hope that I've given you a relatively novel view of everything that happened in, uh, well, not everything, but so many of the uh, uh, scientific related events that took place during the Victorian era, uh, essentially the 1800s. And um, it also was very interesting to see uh, how far we have come from that era. And, uh, you know, things that were such novelties in those days now have become a uh, part of our, our life. But the 1800s really were, were, it was the century of discovery. It was um, a century of uh, live entertainment. And uh, so for me, a very, very interesting period in our, our, our history. Uh, again, let me remind you that we do have a, a website where uh, you can find thousands of interesting different articles. Uh, you can sign up for a weekly newsletter, which of course is, is free. And uh, we have a search on there so you can look for whatever may uh, interest you. And uh, if you have any uh, questions or any comments about uh, science in the Victorian era, or anything related, I'd certainly be happy to uh, try to answer those questions. So thanks very much for your uh, attention.